whether it's for CS class, async coding interviews, or building your own application. A solid understanding of data structures and knowing several key ones is essential for efficiently storing, accessing, and managing data. So as a developer, there's just no way around them. So without further ado, let's dive into the most crucial data structures and break them down along the way. So stay tuned. The first and most fundamental data structure is the array. It can store multiple elements in a contiguous memory location. It has a fixed size and each element in the array is identified with an index that goes from zero to size minus one. We can access and overwrite values in the array with a time complexity of O of one. If we have dynamic arrays, appending elements to it is also possible, despite it having a fixed size. But the catch is we would need to find an empty spot in our memory, copy all the elements from the old array to the new one, and then finally append the new element to it. But as we can see, the effort to do all of this costs all of n operations. A data structure that does the resizing better is called a linked list. So a linked list in its simplest form consists of nodes where each node stores a data and a pointer that can point to the next data block. Unlike an array, a linked list does not require a contiguous memory location. Instead, the linked list nodes can be scattered throughout the memory because each node contains a pointer that references the next node of the list. Another important aspect is when we want to access linked list because we typically use a pointer that points to the beginning of the list known as a head pointer. Additionally, the last man in the list has no successor so in programming, we usually just set the pointer to now, which is basically a placeholder representing nothing. All right, then let's talk about the operations. For simplicity's sake, we're not going to use the whole memory representation, just the short version of it. All right, so when we want to add elements to the beginning of our list, we simply create a new node, point it to the current head, and then update the head to this newly created node. This whole operation only cost all of one time because we're just changing a couple of pointers at the start. But let's say we want to add at the end of our list. We would need to iterate through the whole list to get to the end and point the last node pointer to our new node. And the new node will point to now. Since we have to go through every single node in the list, this operation costs us all of n time. The lesion works similarly. Removing an element at the head is lightning fast. We just move the head pointer one element forward to signal the list this is the beginning of our list now, which only costs us all of one. But when we want to remove the last node, we need to iterate through the list again, this time stopping at the second last node to set its pointer to null, so the last element is not part of the list anymore. Just like with insertion at the end, this is all of n operations, because we need to iterate through almost the entire list. Then let's talk about stacks. Stacks can be imagined like a stack of plates. You can only add plates to the top, and remove plates from the top. In programming terms, the plates represent our data. So to add data on top of the stack, we use a function called push. And if we want to remove data from the top, we use pop. Both of these operations are very efficient, typically taking all of one time. This behavior of only adding and removing from the top is also called LIFO, last in, first out principle. All right, sounds pretty easy, but in which scenario is stack actually used? The biggest example is probably for managing function calls of a program, especially during recursion, where things can get messy pretty quickly with nested executions. But the stack ensures we always process the most recent call first, helping us to maintain order even in this messy scenario. The next data structure is called a queue, and it can be easily understood by thinking about waiting in lines. Imagine you're at the movie theater buying a ticket. The person at the front of the line is the first one to get that ticket, while the person at the very end has to wait until everyone else in the front has been served. In programming terms, the people in line represent our data. If we want to remove data from the queue, we can only remove the first element using a function called dq. And if we want to add new data, we can only do that at the end of our queue using nq. Both of these operations also typically run in all of one time. This principle of adding and removing is also known as FIFO, which stands for first in, first out. Okay, then let's explore binary trees. A binary tree is a data structure in which nodes usually have two children referred to as left and right child. These children refer to the node above them as the parent. The node at the very top with no parent is referred as the root. 
With all these terminologies out of the way, what makes the binary tree so special now? Well, each node contains data, and based on this data, we construct our binary tree by placing nodes that are greater than or equal to the parent on the right and smaller elements on the left. With this property, we've created a data structure that is efficient and maintains a sorted system. How is it efficient, you might ask? We say binary trees are efficient because of how they allow us to search for elements. Let's say we want to check if 33 exists in our binary tree. All we have to do is compare the value with the current node. If it's larger, we move to the right. If it's smaller, we move to the left. We continue this process until we either find the node or reach the node with no children. And either this element is the value we're looking for, and if not, the element just doesn't exist in the tree. So basically, we only need O of H time, where H is the height of the tree, to determine whether an element is present in the tree or not. If we would compare this to searching in a linked list, where the worst case we have to iterate through the entire list, meaning O of N, the binary tree is much more efficient. But like most things in life, there's still a catch. If we build the binary tree by continuously adding numbers that are larger than the previously added one, all the elements end up on the right side. In this case, the tree becomes unbalanced and essentially turns into a linked list. The height of the tree is still h, but in this scenario h equals n, so the time for searching complexity becomes O of n, which is no better than a linked list and not very efficient anymore. To solve this problem, we can use a self-balancing binary tree called AVL tree. An AVL tree automatically keeps itself balanced by ensuring that for every node, the height of the left and right subtrees only differ by one or less. So if we would now trying to delete or insert an element, causing the tree to have an imbalance greater than one, we would use left or right rotations to restore the balance in the tree. Because of the rebalancing, our tree will always have a height of log n. So thanks to the rebalancing, it will never degrade into a linked list anymore and we solve the problem. All right, now pay attention to this one because hash tables often gonna be your answer in coding interviews. So what are hash tables? So hash tables in the core are using arrays, but unlike an array, we can't just directly access values by accessing the index. Instead, we have elements in the hash table, also called entry, that have a key and a value. So every time we want to add, delete, or edit an element in our hash table, we need to take the key, pass it through a so-called hash function, which outputs an index in our hash table where we can perform our operations in our entry. An important thing to note about the hash function is that it needs to be very fast, ideally running in all of one. Typically, this involves performing some mathematical operations to compute the index in the hash table. Another important aspect is that our hash function should minimize the chance that different keys produce the same index, also known as a collision. But if collisions happen when adding elements, a common way to handle them is using chaining, where we just store multiple elements at the same index using a linked list. However, we want to avoid collisions as much as possible, since too many of them can slow down the performance by a lot. Then let's talk about the time complexities. So for the average case, read, write and delete operations in a hash table are all of one. But in the worst case scenario, for example, if the hash function is poorly designed and causes many collisions, our operations could slow down to O of n because we would potentially just have a linked list. Now let's dive into heaps. Heaps are binary tree-like structures that are usually implemented using arrays. We differentiate between max heaps and min heaps. In a max heap, the condition is that each parent node must be greater than or equal to its children, while in a min heap, each parent must be less or equal to its children. Okay, what does this actually apply now? So the heap property just states that parents must be bigger or smaller than their childs, meaning there's no guaranteed system between the childs. There can always be a bigger element on the left and a smaller on the right and vice versa. Because of this, a heap is considered a partially sorted structure, not fully sorted. Then let's talk about the operations in the heap. If we now want to add an element to our heap, we place the new element on the bottom of the tree at the most left position. After we insert it, we then compare the element with its parent. If the heap criteria is violated, we swap the elements, we repeat this process until the heap property is restored or we reach the root. 
In the end, this operation runs in all of log n time, because the tree is always log n high. Then let's talk about accessing the root. When we access the root, it's only a simple call of O of 1, because the root in the error implementation is always at index 0. But what if we wanted to delete the root now? The first step would be swap the root with the last element of the tree and then remove the last element. Then we compare the new root with his children and swap with the child if the heap criteria is violated. We do this till all the way to the bottom or the heap criteria is already fulfilled before. And as we can see, this operation runs in all of log n time. Now people might be wondering why we only discuss about deleting and accessing at the root. The reason is that heaps, due to their partially ordered structure, they are only most commonly used to implement priority queues. Priority queues always remove the most important element first, meaning the element with the highest priority is used as the first in the queue, which aligns perfectly with how heaps work. We remove the root since it holds the highest or the lowest value. Okay, we're finally at the last, but also very important data structure called graphs. A graph contains vertices and edges. Vertices are usually represented as circles, where edges are the lines that connect those circles. When it comes to types of graphs, we generally distinguish between undirected and directed graphs. In an undirected graph, the edges are just lines, indicating that the connection between two vertices is mutual, meaning you can freely move back and forth along an edge. On the other hand, a directed graph uses arrows instead of just simple lines to show the direction is just in one direction, meaning you can only move in the direction the arrow points. Another thing for both cases is that we can also put weights on the edges, which basically can be interpreted as the cost we need to go from one vertex to another vertex. Okay, why are they so important now? Well, one of the most famous example of them is probably the shortest path problem, which we can model with graphs, and the tons of algorithms that also come with shortest path. But to dive deeper in these algorithms is a topic for another time. But yeah, that's actually it with the most important data structures that everyone should know. If you have any suggestions, write it down in the comment section below. But just as always, see you in the next one. Bye.